Welcome to our fourth season of Corner Table Talk. Uh, I can't believe it. It's it's four years. And Marcus Samuelson is here to join us. And I, I started out by thinking, you know, Marcus is the biggest chef in the country, one of the biggest restaurateurs and chefs in the country. And then I had to back that up. I said, wait a minute, he's one of the biggest chef restaurateurs in the world. Um, you've been growing and you've been busy, man. First of all, welcome to the program. Great to see you, man. Thank you for making the time. Marcus Samuelson is here. What's up, man? I'm good, bro. It's good to talk to you. I uh, talked to you on your podcast, and I'm so proud of you guys because I remember when you were talking about the idea, and like all of us, going from ideation to actual, it's something that we do as restaurateurs all the time, right? We have an idea, and then we get the architects and everybody involved, and then we operate. And here you on the other side, working on content and Making us connect is something that you always done. Making us connect, making us show up, and uh, always sparking interesting conversation, whether it's a table in one of your restaurants or here. So congrats, and thank you for having me. Thank you, man. Thank you. You know, it's funny you bring that up that, uh, you know, I I spent a little time in the film business when I lived in L.A., and one of the things that I found the most frustrating, Marcus, that I actually found relief in in our industry was our ability to, to do it actually do it you know Mm -hmm. i needed 25 yeses from people the 24 wanted to say no and the the process of getting anything done was really really painful whereas we have an idea we know how to do this we find our location we cobble together the money and 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 we manage to open these places and i and i find that very rewarding about uh about our industry and our ability as entrepreneurs to to open these doors yeah, and I, I, I think you nailed it. We cobbled together the money, our path, our whole difference, but we work hard for it. We connect with people and we gatherers, right? We gatherer of an idea, of our travels, of our heritage, and then we want to present it to our community first and foremost, right? We built this response for our community and hopefully they go and tell their friends and so on, right? Also, you know, Brad, you've always been a big inspiration, a big, big, inspiration for me because the restaurant that I have today, starting with Red Rooster, which was really a turn for me, right? It was really a big decision to leave Midtown, which I enjoyed from the precision and from the sort of the elite level of cooking that you can do. But it was also lonely. It was not a space that I knew that I was inspired by. And if I could do it differently, I asked myself that question. I think in the long run, I would keep my joy and I would keep, I found out, find out about my heritage, my Ethiopian, my blackness, my, what would that mean? And the restaurants I always went to and looked at was a lot of restaurants that you were involved with or we both know. So, you know, you never know who you're going to inspire, right? Like, like we both love Alberta and Jezebel's, but even before that, the restaurants that your father had and even Restaurants are not nationwide known, but we knew, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. like the Shark Bar yeah. or, of course, the amazing Rest in Peace, B. Smith. Yeah. So, so, and I lived in Health Kitchen, so I had the, yeah, I could just walk to some of these restaurants. And I didn't know it at the time, but all of that sort of became my rhythm and memory for like, okay, this is how I'm going to put Rooster together. This is different. So we don't know who walks into one of my restaurants today or walk into one of your restaurants and be like, you know, five years from 10 years from now, I'm going to do it. So I, I, I want our restaurant not just be good for our soul and for, for our tummy, of course, but also great for inspiration. So the next gen will do it even better. Absolutely, man. Well, you know, I wanted to start the season off with you, and I'm really grateful, man, that you made the time. I know how busy you are, and I know how demanding your schedule is, so I'm, I'm really grateful. But, Marcus, you have a way of, I mean, sir, first of all, you have a lens into, you have a worldview. So you have a lens into culture around the world, certainly from, you know, where you were born and your upbringing, but also to your business acumen. And just, I listened to the interviews and, and the way that you address the things that we're all wrestling with from the economy to wow. staffing on a restaurant level to just humanity. So I'm really grateful that you're here. And I want to get into a few of those things. I'm not going to keep you very long, but there are a number of subjects I want to touch on. But before we do, I still like to uh, throw out my short order questions. So I got a few of those for you. You good to go? 
Good go. Right, Good man. to go. What are you listening to? I know you're a runner. What what's in your earbuds, man, when you're when you're pounding on the pavement and then you're putting in your miles in the morning? What motivates you? What are you listening to? A ton. I'm old school. So I'm listening to Prince. I'm listening to D'Angelo. I'm listening to old Lauren. I'm listening old school Michael. Like not even I mean, probably more off the wall than anything. I love Gap Band, and and then I also listen to a lot of podcasts because I I I am global, so I have to stay up on what's happening in Africa. I got to stay up on what's happening in Scandinavia. So a lot of my running is actually listening to podcasts and just understanding the movement, the shift that's happening in Europe right now. Yeah. yeah, you know, obviously as a host of a podcast, I'm I'm encouraged to hear anybody that that listens to them. But you know, I found that. Uh, as a music lover that uh, in place of music sometimes for me as well, when I'm working out or when I'm falling asleep, a podcast really fits yeah. kind of a different, uh, yeah. a different mood for me. And I enjoy it on the music tip and on the Michael thing, man, if you get a chance that we are the world documentary that Lionel Richie yeah. is uh, boy, oh boy, the making of that song and Michael and Lionel coming together and creating that song is, is a worthwhile watch on Netflix, man, if you get a chance. Yeah, no, I'm excited about it. I got to actually locked in. And it's Qu Quincy, which is one of my, Quincy is probably the person in entertainment that I admire the most. Yeah, and his genius you in know. that uh, Netflix special is on full display. So I, I think you'll wow. enjoy that. Can't wait. Yep. So you have restaurants around the world, man. Who makes your playlist? And is it the I same make... music? You, you're making them in a, everywhere? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but I, I give an idea to the team and then, you know, the team puts it together. But I mean, I feel like, you know, we have, all of us, no matter who you are, you have a side of you that you can really show through the music and through, sometimes they fit through the food too. You know, so I like to randomly mix in Afrobeats. Mm -hmm. And I like to even go back to Fit Lot, so kind of the father of Afrobeat, mm -hmm. right? So, so really, because obviously Fit Lot had a huge, huge impact on Stevie and and American funk, and a lot of those musicians played in the same bands, actually. Uh -huh. And then also I have the Scandinavian side where you can really move into things. And, and because I think music in a restaurant should be part of the beat, but I don't think it should really be, you know, it, it, just, it shouldn't take over, but right. it should be part of that rhythm, you know. So I, I, we work a lot. I look at the decor as a character, the food as a character, and the music as a character mm -hmm. by its own, too. It's a complementary balance, right? I mean, you've got to have yes. some music. Yeah. You've got to have that vibe, but it can't be overpowering to the extent that you can't hear the person that you came to have dinner with, right? Yes. Yeah, it's a challenge yes. we face. So tell me, I know you don't get many nights off, and please don't say you stay home as an answer to this question, but favorite mm -hmm. date spot for you and Maya, where, where do you go? One of our favorite things is to, to walk around and be in Ireland because... The, the level of different hospitality that you find on the streets of Harlem, first of all, it's a neighborhood in the city, right? It's a neighborhood that is as famous as a borough. You know, when you think about Harlem, someone might think about the Bronx or Brooklyn. Well, wait a minute. Those, those two are boroughs with millions of people. Harlem is just this incredible community, especially, you know, our block. We walk down the street. Neighbors are sitting on the stoop in your business, on your business, talking to you, talking about you. So I just love that, right? That engagement. And then, you know, going down, just walking into, you know, maybe the pastry shop and seeing what's up and, and, and checking on, you know, do we have a big birthday coming up? So we make sure that she makes the birthday cake. And for me, it's a lot about seeing the other small businesses in my neighborhood and making sure that they're good. Mm. Go into a little bar around the corner, it's called Good Good, and our friend Leslie just opened. Um, not so much, obviously, running over to Melba's and stuff like that, but making sure that Paris Blues is still there, right? So I'm, I'm watching and making sure that we highlight the businesses that are going through rough times. Yeah. Yeah. So you, for me, it's about being unk in the neighborhood, and I have a pipeline, and uh, so it's a different way of going out versus, because when they're closed, Harlem changes forever. That's right. Yeah. 
you know. I want to bridge into, let's, we'll jump in here because I want to bridge into an interview that I listened to and watched that you had given at the, uh, an event for Forbes. And you talked about something in a, in a really interesting way that I, I hadn't thought about it before, and that's philanthropy and how there are many ways to administer philanthropy. It doesn't necessarily have to be writing a check. And when you talk mm. about moving around the neighborhood and checking on these places and, you know, bringing to them whatever you might be able to bring to them, advice, uh, what, what, whatever that might be that a Marcus Samuelson walking in your mm. door if you're a local operator in Harlem might, might mean to you. Uh, the, the, the restaurant clientele seeing Marcus in that room is there's collateral value in that. Um, but talk about that a little bit, Marcus. I really found that interesting, this idea of, yeah. of philanthropic contributions that don't mean writing a check. Yeah. I mean, we all land on volunteering philanthropy in different ways. We had to TB, me and my sister, my mom, my mom passed and me and my sister survived. So we, from the first, from the get-go, were raised a lot around helping out whether it's the Lions Club, whether it's the Red Cross. This was part of our DNA. And uh, when you're adopted, you know, every adopted journey is different, but that was part of what we were raised. We also grew up in a fishing village where my grandparents on my father's side, they were fishing men. And my father, his DNA was really being a fisherman, which meant that you always help out. If a boat breaks down, if you know how to fix it, you go down there. If there's fish to be sold or cured or smoked, you do it. And there was never really cash traded at that. You might got 10 more fishes and you can sell them yourself on your own. So we were raised around bartering. We were raised in a community, constantly around it. So when I think about check writing is one part, and that's where a certain person can help out. All of us have experience and are professionals at some way. Right? So if you are an accountant, you can actually volunteer and help that small business restaurant because it's all money for them. It's all when taxes comes up or when a, a law, if you're a lawyer, you can help your local restaurant in terms of law and negotiate a new deal with a landlord. There's so many, if you're a young person that are great on social media, guess what? Where are these businesses struggling? They're struggling to cutting through in this time and day when it's tough to cut through. Well, a better social media presence would be helpful. So it doesn't matter. Anyone from 15 and up can truly help. Whether that's one week, one hour a week, five hours a month, or 10 hours a quarter, mm -hmm. you can help out. Mm -hmm. And it's this type in a tough economy it's this type of community thing that's going to get us to the next place. Because when you look at small businesses, particularly black and brown communities, it's paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. And um, that $800 or $4,000 check you have to write to a lawyer, if you can narrow that down to maybe like a couple of hundred dollars instead, that's profit for that restaurant makes that quarter. Yeah. Makes a difference. Yeah. yeah. I want to pause on that for a moment, Marcus, and I, I just really love that, man. That was so insightful, but I want to stay specifically on our industry for the moment and that we know here we are, it's 2024. The pandemic was 2020, lasted well into 21, 22, even 23. And now what we're finding is a lot of the businesses that had managed to hang on um, are now having some of that reality come due in the way of loans they might have taken out or PPP funds that have dried up or whatever the, you know, the um, acceleration of issues that were happening in our industry prior to the pandemic that have now caught up. And you're seeing a lot of closures, particularly in places like Los Angeles, who had the double whammy of a writer's strike following the pandemic. So it dried up the economy even more. So I guess my question, uh, two questions here. One, Marcus, I'm finding that the model of the independent restaurant is a tougher model than ever before to make ends meet with. Is that something that will survive? Because what seems to me to be happening is that these restaurant groups, and of course you have one of them, there are certain economies that just are advantageous to having a big group back you, behind you, that you just don't have the advantage of in a small business. Is that model becoming going to become an obsolete model or will it all, always survive? 
and just gen- kind of generally your overview about where we are post pandemic and some of those challenges that uh, that you maybe even at your level that you're having to confront. I would start with saying, will small independent mom and pop be okay? Yes. The overall answer is absolutely. Because we always figure out a way to serve in any economy and find a way. Now, do we have to do it differently? Absolutely. And I think in many ways, the word mom and pop needs to be family now because the young ones can help you. You cannot survive without a good tech model. Before you had to serve great food and you were good. But in order to reach, you need a tech apparatus on top of that, a social media game on top of that. And most likely to bring that in is the kids. So this is actually the moment where what immigrants does all the time, right? It's like, okay, the kid speaks better English. You guys do that. You job work front of the house. The parents are back in the house. There is a new model of that out there that is, involves texts and social media that you can't cut out of it. So I do think the independent small business restaurant will continue to pop up because it's just the nature of who we are. But you have to do it together in a different way. I think in many ways, if you keep it small, you can have a better way to navigate because you have less cost. Mm-hmm. So if you just do it, you find your place, you find a pocket that works for you, you can do better than ever, whether you are that Asian family and selling the best John John rice or griot in your community because of TikTok and social media. More others are now interested in that ethnic food that they weren't before. Mm-hmm. So now it's about how do we, where do you meet that customer? How do you meet that customer? And that's going to happen through social media. So it's never easy. No one can tell me that selling soul food on Adam Clayton 7th Avenue in the middle of 80s or 90s was easy, right? There was another crisis going on, mm-hmm. right? So I think the Immigrant and as people of color, we always dealt with crisis, but what had never stopped is our capability to invest. We cre- created some of the best dishes during the roughest times. We created some of the best art. Where does hip hop come from? Mm-hmm. It comes from struggle. Mm-hmm. We created some of the best music during these times. So I think if you want to create a business, you cannot do it without walking through the struggle. Right. If you want to be struggle and burst, well, then this is not the right space for you. I don't know what that environment is. You know what I mean? It ain't this. <laughs> no, it ain't. So, Marcus, I was texting with David Chang a couple of weeks ago about an idea in L.A., and he made this statement to me that I found, you know, not a big surprise, but also somewhat discouraging, and that he feels that it's all about Instagram now. That, you know, concept, decor, it's all about Instagram now. And I, I don't know, I'm, I'm older than I, you know, than, than would have me inclined to believe that that might be true. I'd like to think that there's a counter culture to that and that you present something good. Obviously you have to, you know, put it out there to the world and let people know and, and go through the proper channels to do that. But do you see it that way? Is, is it, is Instagram really that essential? Well, I, I don't know if it's Instagram, I would say social media, mm-hmm. because, you know, in, in two years, there might, you know, Snapchat or TikTok, or there's other ways. So I can't pick down on which platform is the strong, independent of which audience. You know, if you're selling bubble tea, that's a different audience versus selling uh, roasted chicken, for example, right. right? But I do think, and then for a second, let's hold mm-hmm. on to that. If we talk about social media being the thing that you need, well, maybe that's actually a good thing for Black Wall Street. Because guess what? It's free advertisement if you can articulate it, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. In a way. Mm -hmm. So before you had to do, go back 15, 20 years ago, you had to take out a quarter page in the New York Times. Well, listen, that excluded us completely. We can't afford to take a quarter page out in the New York Times on Sundays. So maybe this is a better way. So a little more democracy. in in A little bit more even playing for it. So I, I, I am constantly thinking about tech versus human, human versus tech. And I'm going to keep on investing in my humanity and my staff and my team. But I'm also not going to say that tech is the bad 
big bag devil, this is something we have to work with and, and where we find the balance between how much tech and how much human interaction, that's, that's the journey that we are, yep. right? Yep. I, I like my chances. I like my chances with $50 in the pocket coming here in the mid nineties. <laughs> I like my chances now. And I, uh, and I just, I just love us. I love food and I love my curiosity. I'm curious. Yeah. Yeah, well, that, that shows, man. So let's talk about mm -hmm. where your curiosity has led you. You've opened a few places since we uh, last had you on the podcast. <clears throat> so I want to spend just a, a little brief time in, on each one and just, you know, you kind of give me a little bit of the flavor. So Metropolis is part of a $500 million at a Perlman Performing Arts Center right near World Trade. You've got some personal and emotional journey for you there. I know that you fed the uh, workers who were excavating after 9-11. So for you to be back there in this way, in such a grand way, and the neighborhood's trying to make a comeback as a, you know, as a, as a hub. So talk about Metropolis and what's the concept And David Brockwell, I, I think designed the place, one of the most esteemed architects in the world. That's a pretty prestigious project on a very special piece of property in New York. So talk about that a little bit, if you will. Thank you for bringing Metropolis up. It's really a darling for us, for me and the team, and we wanted to be a doll in New York City. You're right. You know, a week before 9-11, I was cooking with Chef Michael in Monaco at Windows of the World. And then the world changed. Windows of the World, it was a restaurant that all of us came to at some point of the year, whether we went there for brunch, whether we went there with a friend out of town, or whether we did events there. Michael always kept the door open for all of us in the community, in the hospitality. And... Before we opened this, I brought Michael in. I said, Michael, we can't start without you talking to the team. And they did. And we were grateful she spent time with us that afternoon. I'll never forget it. And every time I walk up those stairs to get into the restaurant, I think about it with a sense of pride and how life is full circle. This is now a huge privilege for the entire team to put a restaurant in the middle of an art and culture center. 20 years later, turned around such a dramatic, horrific incident to now to be a culture center. There was always the Memorial Center and the museum was built pretty quickly, but it was also decided when they decided on that to always put a culture center there. They just had to go and raise the money to do it. And Ron Perlman and Mike Bloomberg stepped up and raised the money and did it. And uh, that's why we focused the food experience around the city. And proud of Chef Ed and, and Alexis and bar program. It's a dramatic restaurant. And we wanted to be like New York City, like the subway, very democratic. You can come in and see a show for free at the public stage. You can come and sit in our bar. You can be at the high end part of the restaurant, or you can be on the outdoor patio and just have a beer. These days, when you're just cooking for the 1% of the 1%, I don't just want to do that. I want to make sure the bus driver, the school teacher, person that worked transportation, whatever it is, feels that they can be part of it. Just like a great gap band for everybody. It's for everybody. You know, I'm going to digress just for a second, Marcus, because in, in just listening to you now talk about having the chef from Windows of the World come and talk to your staff there. I know this is part of your charisma, but it's not an act. You know, for you, it's a, it's a very sincere expression. You managed to have a, so much going on, but at the same time, even during this conversation, you're very present and you're very thoughtful. What, how, how do you quiet down the noise so that you think through situations like, have, I mean, there's so, so much to do with opening a restaurant. One of the last things you might think of is the message that a chef from Windows of the World, that the chef from Windows of the World might deliver that would be meaningful. You had a million things going on, yet you knew to do that. How do you, quiet, how do you keep your mind quiet enough to hear the important stuff? My parents raised me hard. They were hard on us, but he raised me hard. My father was jolly. Geology's PhD, ran its own business, but he was a fisherman. And what I mean with that is that I watched my dad. He was the first person to go to university in its village, right? So when we came to the village, 
the door was open. He needed to read a lawyer letter for a house that was being sold for one fisherman. He needed to translate something in French for another person, for fishing rights, or something in English for fishing waters rights between where the UK and, and Sweden. There was all kinds of stuff going on in the house because he was the most educated person. He wasn't a lawyer, but he was the most educated person that they knew. Mm-hmm. So I watched it, not quite me. So I grew up with this. It was always an open door. There was always people eating at our table, being there. And my dad said they have to be here. And so that was what happened in our space. We were raised in a very, I realize now in a different way, you know, having white parents being three black kids, but also having a Jewish auntie and Korean cousins. So don't assume anything about anybody. That was like the mantra at home. We were raised hard, you know. Um, we were eight, nine years old and we have to have English weeks at home. That's not fun. You're sitting at a kitchen table. And you just want to say, this is the path for the milk. And you, nope, you have to stand in English. Because my parents raised me in a way that they knew as three black kids, they're probably one or two of them going to have to move abroad. Mm-hmm. So they had the inside of them. Mm-hmm. My father gave me Malcolm autobiography when I was 14. I had to read it in English. And then I had to explain it to him. So hard. Like, this yeah. wasn't homework. Yeah. He's like, homework? Psh, <laughs> this is homework. Right. You know, my mom didn't trust the English teacher because she was Swedish. So we had to like read back Bob Marley's records. So with all of these white parents, always in black context, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And like Stevie, they took me to Stevie concerts. Uh, so with all of these things that happened that forced me to slow down. Otherwise, you know, I was a very energetic kid and still am and that energetic person. But there was moments where you just have to slow down. And little did I know without my knowledge, my father in Ethiopia was a tribe leader. Mm-hmm. I didn't find that out until I was 25, or six years mm-hmm. old. So when I go to Ethiopia 20 years later, what do well, I see happening? His hut is a little bit bigger than the other huts. This is on a hut level. People are coming in and out of the house. He's telling people what land they can grow on. So it's a very similar context in terms of leadership. With the worlds apart, right? Technology, finance, but similar. So I was raised around leadership, subconsciously and consciously yeah. of my time. So part of your DNA and then also part of your learning. And so it's foundational for you. It is. Mm-hmm. But I would say, on the other hand, this is the other side. Mm-hmm. That the, the chefs raised me too. So food, oh, I always say that food saved me. Right. You know how it is as an energetic young boy. You can do take that energy and go on the wrong side, or you can take that energy and be on the right side. And I would say that my chefs, my mentors early in my career really saw things in me that forced me to focus. Right. I was sent to Japan early. I was sent to France to work in a three star Michelin restaurant, not speaking French. I had to learn French. You know, so that took me years to to understand. So th- 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 these experiences humbled me a lot, right? And it was rough. But I, what I got out of were just you know, searing scallops and 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 peeling asparagus, which was great craft. That was what we were. That was the task. Mm-hmm. That wasn't the gift that I was that I got out of it. Right. The gift was much higher. Oh, that's beautiful, man. Well, let's take the scallop reference and and segue mm-hmm. over to have Mar. Uh, a mm-hmm. restaurant that she opened in uh, in Chelsea. And I read the uh, review Pete Wells wrote. And one of the things that, uh, a couple of things that really struck me, one, of course, the um, the women of color dominance in your kitchen, the exposed kitchen, so folks are visible and you can actually see who's, who's doing the work back there. He made note of that. But he also talked about, Marcus, the diversity of the staff and the diversity of the clientele and how rare that he felt that that is uh, below 110th Street. For those of you who don't know New York, 110th Street is the border between Manhattan or Manhattan and Harlem. So we often talk about what happens above and below 110th Street. Talk about, if you will, the inspiration behind Have Martin. Again, you know, here's, this is your, your conscientious, you know, about not just this is a great corner or a great location, a great building. I just am energized. I want to open a restaurant. 
But you you think through these concepts and you put these mm. pieces in place that are meaningful, black mermaids on the wall. I mean, you know, this beautiful art and this this thoughtful uh, process behind opening. So give us a little a little taste, if you will, of Have Mar. Well, first of all, I'm deeply in love with New York City, right? And if you love something, you got to put thought into it if you want to talk to her. New York has given me everything, a place, a sense of who I am. And I've had a couple of meaningful conversations in food with the city. But the New York gave a Swedish black chef a chance to have it, you know, be part of this. And then in Harlem with Red Rooster. So I don't shoot a lot in New York City. I don't do a lot of restaurants. But if I do them, they better come with thoughtfulness and showing that, hey, I love this place, but let's put some thought to it. Otherwise, don't do it. How many albums have Sade done? Mm -hmm. Right? Maybe five? Mm -hmm. I don't know. But she's 40 years later. All classics. You know, yeah. all classics, <laughs> right? So I look at that. Mm -hmm. You know, there were years between Bad and Thriller. I think Thriller came out in three, Bad maybe came out in seven, something like that. So it's years mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. that Quincy and Michael put in. Like, think about it. Mm -hmm. Thriller was nine songs. Nine songs. That's crazy. All slam. You know? <laughs> all slam. And different notes. So I think about that song. But that had 70 songs to choose from. Mm -hmm. So for me, during the pandemic, yeah. there was a couple of things that happened. When Jose oh. and World Central Kitchen really gave me sanity. I've been, I've been doing this since I was 18 years old. And if I don't go to work and I don't have, I don't know myself. Right? So me sitting, the idea of sitting down was just as scary of what will my revenue and I'm going to take him and my staff. So I was scared. I was angry. I was upset. And then Jose said, hey, can you open Rooster? We can serve. We can serve the community. We have people. We know how to do it safety, safely. So me putting on my clothes, gloves, mask, serving 100 people a day, 200 people a day, 400 people a day, 800 people a day, 1,500 people a day eventually, right? And those lines changed, right? It was first the food insecure community, but then it was people taking buses and cars coming up because Red Rooster food, right? That's what we gave out. But what it gave me, it gave my sanity because mm. I now have, and then get my wife sanity too. I now left in the morning, morning, got dressed, worked for a couple of hours, three, four hours, got that out, felt good, had a dialogue with the customers. And it doesn't matter if you eat for free or you pay $200. You're still going to have an opinion change. about it. Yeah. And Holland's yeah. going to let you know, <laughs> why, did, why, did we, why didn't we get yeah. apple for, that, for dessert right. today? Hey, man, I like the chicken you served last time. Right. And we were going back and forth. Right. And I'm like, yes. Love it. So again, as black people during a very difficult time, we find joy. Mm -hmm. We see each other. Mm -hmm. And they're not cutting me any stuff. You're not. They're like, they're on me. So I'm like, okay. But I was smile. I started to smile in May and June and July, which I hadn't done for a month. So that was one part. And I say that because the other part, and you're talking to a person that probably mm -hmm. works in 12 to 13 hours a day. Just that's like rhythm. Between, can I get a workout in between? Great. But I'm, I'm, when I leave the house, I'm not coming back until late, at, late in the evening. So I had time. Was a lot of calls on independent restaurant uh, calls and just doing stuff, talking to other chefs, talking to you, talking to people. At that point, we didn't know if we would ever, restaurants would ever be coming. Mm -hmm. So I started saying, hey, if I ever get a chance to do another restaurant, I started to first acknowledge to think that we've done well. Open kitchen, focusing on black chefs and, and senior management position. Then I started to think about, as a chef with the platform, what can we do better? What can my team do better? And actually take a stand, not in ideation, but actually actions, mm -hmm. advocacy, and actually provide those positions. And that's what I thought about. You know what? We need to do more in leadership for women, for women of color. Not just talking about it, actually putting it out. And uh, that was when that 
we started to really put the Hawk Mart down. I wanted, I wanted a name that embodied the experience of being, to having three different realities like between New York, Ethiopia, and Sweden. And I grew up in a fishing village, so Hav means ocean. Mar is honey in Amharic, sweet water. For me, that means that the bar is the mar, it's the stickiness, it's the sweet. The kitchen, the cuisine is water, our seafood focus. And then when I met Derek Adams, I'm like, you can't open a restaurant in, in Chelsea and don't have a serious art conversation. So making Thelma Golden and Derek Adams partners in the business, the fact that they're black artists and, and, and ambassadors for art was important for me. So can we do a black owned experience south of 110th Street? with a highly focus on art and the with a high focus on women of color. And it was with that puzzle and those challenges that I felt like this, I'm going to hold on to this. At the same time, you, you, you know, you got to flip. But at the same time, I'm dealing with a landlord. When you're negotiating rent, mm -hmm. you got to you gotta be tough mm -hmm. on that other side. I don't bring any of this stuff. That's, not, that's, that's the softer skill. So the important sort of Stuff into that other dime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we were battling here. We got the restaurant and uh, we got it. From yeah. And to, to work with Fariel, you know, she was in Ethiopia and I called her up. After five minutes of explaining what we're doing, she's like, I'm moving. <laughs> in the middle of COVID, she's like, I'm wow. moving. I can be there in three months. Yeah. I got COVID right now with my family in Ethiopia, but I, I'll be there in three months. Because I'd imagine you have that effect on people. You get a call from Marcus Samuelson, and it's a it's a tough no. <laughs> more more oftentimes, it's a yes. Let's uh, that's a beautiful story, man. Let let's um jump to Atlanta, because mm -hmm. I found I was surprised actually that uh, that you chose to open a restaurant there, but but not really. I mean, I'm certainly aware of uh, Atlanta's prominence as a cultural hub for the black community nationally and probably internationally, but. I'm curious why, why now? I mean, I think you opened maybe a year ago or so. I've had friends that have gone there and love it. Your view of Atlanta and, and why uh, Marcus Bar and Grill there now? I love Atlanta. I love the music from Atlanta. I love all the hip hop and the culture and what it manifests to the world, whether it's Luda or Andre or Gladys Knight or, you know, you can go on and on and on. I, I'm very specific with locations. I felt like, if we're going to do something, we can't start in that bucket mm -hmm. because that's the most foot traffic. Mm -hmm. I want to be in a, in a historical black neighborhood community. So to find the right piece, 5,000 and up square feet in, in the right building that can hold up because once we open the restaurant, it's a lot of traffic and it's got to hold up. It took a long time. And then to, during the pandemic, spaces opened up and um, Howard, my business partner, said, hey, we got this lot here. What if we do markets in there? You know, I looked at it, I stepped in. I said, it felt right right away. That open kitchen and that bar to the left with the James Baldwin in painting in the back, I'm like, so with me. And then it was really about homework. So I started to listen to a lot of musicians' interviews, like I listened to Jermaine Dupree, Babyface, called Erica Reed, you know, and Tony's wife, that she went to school in Atlanta, that lived in Atlanta. And I'm like, talk to me about when you went to Spellman, what it, what it looked like, you know? And started to listen to a lot of 90s R&B, you know? And I, need the, I know the song. Of course, you know, but but that was an important state piece to understand it, right? And once I had that, it was an Usher interview and a Jermaine, Jermaine interview that I started to understand about Cascade and the roller skating. So once I had that, I knew culturally the roller skates would be part of our DNA. So I knew there was a lot a persona there that I wanted to. And I knew a lot of the artists, so it's like, okay, like let's talk, let's talk to a couple of people and 
let's let's make it happen. Did you did you get a sense at all? Because there's been talk in the last few years about this pattern of reverse migration for Black Americans who left the South for points north and now have started to migrate <clears throat> south again. Charles Blow comes to mind, the New York Times columnist who left New York and I believe lives in Atlanta. Did you get a sense of a of a shift in that way culturally, Marcus? It is. It is. I mean, Atlanta in any other country would be a capital, right? Because it has everything. It has finance. It has a big convention center. It has obviously those institutions, those universities, brings a whole intellectual scholar, that level of it- intelligentsia around it, whether it's more of scum, Bellman, Georgia Tech, and you can go on and on and on, right? That, and a lot of people stay post-college, they stay. So there is always this thinking tribe and this entrepreneurial side. To it. And then at the same time, you have the mom and pops, and then you have the musicians, and then you have the artists. And now it's becoming even a, a, a tech city. You know, Microsoft and Google is down there and Amazon. So now we have tech. So it, it, it's a capital. Anywhere else it would be a capital. In the largest airport or one top three airport in the world, mm-hmm. right? Not in America, in the world. So it, it has that. And capability, and of course, with with the movie business, with the black movie business, definitely, you know, uh, Tyler, like you know, really changed that. So there is a lot there, you know, uh, and you can feel it's it's a layered city, it's a tapestry. Of, it feels young because people have moved back, but then of course you have the people that have lived there for a long time. It's their city, so I I I I, I love it. I learn a lot, and I love it study and um we've been there for a year and atlanta has been amazing to us but we got a lot to, we have like all restaurants we have a lot of room to improve mm-hmm. in all of them mm-hmm. you know yeah as i it, mentioned i had friends by. that went there loved it man and uh actually i think they took a picture with you you happened to be there that day so you're spending a little bit of time in atlanta oh well. i love it yeah let's talk about your return to ethiopia i mean this you, we texted around that time i saw uh it announced when you had opened and i and I just had to have a sense. I mean, anybody that knows you has to know what opening a restaurant in your birthplace after the journey that you've been on must mean to you. But talk about that a little bit, Marcus, how that came together and, and just how special it is to be in, um, to be in Ethiopia again with a, with a restaurant at this stage in your life. Oh, it's, it's special. And first of all, big shout out to my wife because this one without Maya, right? Culturally, she is the one that brings Ethiopia home. You know, she she was raised in Ethiopia and left when she was 12, 13 to move to Holland. But she speaks the language. She culturally understands everything about the beat of the country, the, the, the holidays and so on. When we got asked, I always said, if it's the right place where we can connect next generation with a fantastic landmark, we'll do it. I've been offered a couple of places there before. It just wasn't right. So when you put the largest, tallest building in East Africa together, we're in the top floor, we can build a modern restaurant that's just not a great restaurant in Ethiopia. It's a great restaurant anyway. Mm-hmm. That's the goal, right? Why am I here with you? Because I had a chance to travel. I got out. I got a chance to see the world. And it changed my perspective forever. So for me, it's very important, whether it's in Harlem or Newark or, uh, or the Force Ward in Atlanta or in Overtown, I want the, the chefs, the cooks, the runners, the service to be able to have a chance to travel. Because once you start traveling, it changes your world. So in America, we have the opportunity to do that, although only 10% of Americans have ports. Ethiopia, it's very hard, but through hospitality, we can do that. And our restaurant, a partnership with the school where we take 10 scholarships a year and then out of those five can have a chance to travel, come to the states come to scandinavia that's the next generation that's setting up when i went there to talk in the schools and to have the students come and cook with us that was everything i guess it's difficult sometimes we don't have electricity sometimes the water is not right but we fight through it it's given me so much energy and love you know my tribe that lives out in the countryside the tribe came in, at least 30 of them, I don't know, by bus, train, by however they got. And the elders had never been in an elevator. And the restaurant's on the 47th floor. And they didn't trust an elevator, so they wanted to walk up. 
and we had to get them in to elevate. I mean, so that you have to, the cultural differences are so large, not the love for breaking bread or being part of something, but those are the sort of the mountains that hospitality and not being there to be part of. So that's why it gives me so much energy and I, I love my class. I've been very fortunate to find something at an early age that I call a hobby and that I'm deeply in love with. And I'm just as excited about being in the industry today, even on rough days, as I was when I started when I was 17. That's beautiful, man. I want to give a brief shout out to my co-host, uh, dear sister, Ambassador Shabazz, because as you were talking, Marcus, about the uh, small percentage of people that actually have passports, she does quiet work. And as part of the Newark school system, she's been getting passports for the kids there and seeing the joy As on their faces with the realization that they could actually travel to someplace outside of their neighborhood to another country. Uh, it's a really, really warm program. She doesn't talk about it, so I talk about it for her. Beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's really fantastic. Um, I want to close, Marcus. And, and that, I mean, I, the, the image of the villagers... Um, you know, mm. in their hesitation to get on an elevator. I mean, it really does kind of realign um, perspective a bit about mm -hmm. opportunity, about your reality, about just context and, and mm -hmm. what we actually do have. And so this, this next uh, the subject that I just wanted you to, to get to, to hear from you on, I, I feel like I've kind of taken a bit of the um, pessimistic approach and, and then talking to you is so inspiring. It's like, uh, but I still want to go there a little bit because I want, I want you to, I want to draw from you on this. And, you know, we're in the midst of like some crazy times, man. We, you know, of course we talked about the pandemic, which has, still has, you know, lingering effects. Talked about, you know, that there's the economy. There is a, we're in the year of a crazy presidential election where we've got some extreme choices and a lot of dysfunction in government and mistrust in government, mistrust in information, uh, too much information, not enough, you know, knowing where to find good information. Um, immigration, but uh, I'm sure you must have thoughts on, on personally, the global warming, existential crisis. I mean, you could just go on and on and on. I'm a father, you're a father of, of two, young, two young children. You have a world lens, you have a view into culture from around the world. I can only imagine you standing on the 47th floor of your restaurant in Africa and looking out over the continent that still has its challenges, right? I mean, Ethiopia, I think, is still one of the poorest nations in the, in the world, even though it's made significant progress in terms of food shortages and, and education and healthcare, uh, still has got some challenges. But uh, what a unique POV uh, from, that, from that standpoint, looking out over um, you know, the world from there. But just from your standpoint, Marcus, as a young dad, as an entrepreneur and someone who travels the world, Mix some of that up for me and come back to me yeah. with uh, a little vision here and, and how we should still feel good about, um, you know, our, our opportunity as, as a culture to move forward here. I share everything that you just said. And having a two-year-old and having a seven-year-old, I think every day about that. And I look at it from, you know, when we were growing up, boredom was part of our childhood. You played with your sister or brother, your cousin, or whoever was in the neighborhood, and sometimes you got bored. But in that boredom, you had to also figure out how to get out of it. And whether you drew or played music or played a soccer ball, whatever it was, you were back at it 20 minutes later, and it was up to you to make it, make it happen. When I think about my son's generation and my daughter, Wi-Fi is everywhere. So they have to work really, really hard. We have to, parents have to work really, really hard to get them to these places of boredom. Because there is a movie or a game or a platform or something in front of them constantly. So I work a lot. I talk a lot to Zion about that bus ride, 35 minutes it takes for him to go to school. I say, that's your best time in but that time is your time for you to think about what's going to school going to be. It's your way of navigating with the other students on the bus of 
friendship and bonds. And these might not be your classmates. Some of these kids might be older. What a great opportunity for him to engage with somebody that's three years older and navigate that. So finding these pockets that connects us to our, to my childhood, that bus ride is one of those spaces. So I try to look for small, odd rooms. Him and I just walking to the swing class, although it's 20 blocks, and he wonders why we don't take an Uber. We're not taking an Uber. We're walking, regardless of the weather. Regardless of the weather. We're putting another jacket on or a raincoat on or boots. The finding, really working on these pockets of movements, it is something relatable to when you were a child or when I was a child. And those are the moments where we start talking about what he likes and what he doesn't like. So I think those moments are very, very important. So I stay very much in my own space. I, I can't afford not to stay creative. So I've made choices all my life around that. I'm very cautious about hard liquor. I never picked up smoking and save my taste. There's certain rituals to do work out. It's all around keeping my creativity alive at the highest level. And it's by choice. By choice. I have to. So I might not be up on the latest football game or the baseball result, whatever it might be, right? You asked me about certain things. I'm not with those things because I have to be in my head. My state. This is what I trust. This got me to this position. So I'm very much, and, and I feel joy in where we are with food. I feel joy that Clancy wrote a book for the culture. I'm excited about what Kwame is doing. I love the fact that Greg has the most opening Haitian restaurant in Portland. Portland. <laughs> I love the fact that we have. You know, Tavil, Bristol, Joseph, Austin, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The fact that we've had great, great black restaurants in LA or New York or Miami, that's a gift. Mm -hmm. But we're now hitting other, what Eric is doing in Chicago, right? So black food, you know, what's happening, you know, is happening more than ever. And restaurant is not the only way it's happening. It's happening through a podcast like this. High on the hog. Like, so we are in these spaces. We did the work before, but we weren't visible in the work. So I love where we are in America with food. Can we do better? Of course, but we're inspiring and pushing each other. So those are my inspiration sources. I can't, there's so much of the noise. There's so much clear clarity of what we should be doing that everybody knows that it's the wrong choice, but we're not going there as a country because it's a culture war. Republicans mm -hmm. knows what's right. If you want to solve the immigration issue and there's a bill there, and now they're getting a call from the guy to say, hey, we're not going to solve it until hopefully I become the president. So now you're going to have a crisis going on. So everyone knows right and wrong, and this is what they talk about behind closed doors. They all know that this is the wrong thing to do. So that's why I can't afford them to deal with that for one second. How do I deal with those things that still matter? Well, we seek up, we now have a migrant program that we hire migrants. Mm -hmm. So I can deal with it on the world that this little world that we have, but on this noisy level where it's garbage most of the time, I was like, don't enter. And then and, and it's where I can operate and that's where I get my joy from. And um, that, that's my mechanism of, you know, dealing with all that. You that's know? potent, man. That's potent. And it, that, that resonates with me. Um, and, you know, yeah. as, we, as we wrap up here, and, and I know that you've insulated yourself and you keep your creative space, but, you know, we're, I'm a native New Yorker, you're a New Yorker. I, I have to ask you, though, man, what about those Knicks? I, I know, right? What about those I Knicks, know, man? I know. Although, although we had we had a moment about around basketball at the house the other day. Oh my God! I, you know, being cool, you never cool, Dad. That's just never gonna happen, right? <laughs> so I thought I said to my my son, "It's like, let me get tickets so you can see Steph." We don't. I knew as an oldie, I'm like to see Clay, Draymond, and Steph again. It might not happen. Mm -hmm. 
So he's like, I like LeBron. I said, but we can still go and see Steph. So I got tickets to see uh, Brooklyn against Golden State. And, you know, me and my wife been doing this. Like we saw Kobe, one of Kobe's last games and, you know, I was able to see one of Michael's last games. So just these moments of seeing the great ones, yeah. right? I remember seeing Gretzky at Rangers in the end. And just like, I really take joy in from that. And my, my, my son was more like, well, he, Steph didn't play a lot. So why are you excited? <laughs> so like, it's just like what you think is a big moment. Yeah, to them. Might like, not. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I was like, and like Draymond wants to run with knee pads. He's like, oh, the guy with the knee pads. I was like, I was like, all right, all right. I tried, get it, tried. Right? Yeah. So, he was excited about trying to get a t-shirt instead. And, you know, yeah, we, we tried. We had a family day yeah, out. Family. It was great. Well, yeah. Hey, man, I want to thank you, Marcus, man. It's always just uh, whether we talk on the cell phone or we text or, you know, have you as a guest on this podcast, man. I always feel like I leave our conversations richer. So thank you, brother. You're so appreciated, man. I, I really have the utmost of respect and admiration. Oh, thank you, my friend. Thank you, my brother. Thank you, Brad, for everything that you put in. All the restaurants that inspired us, all the conversations, the comments that you are constantly giving to the community, to hospitality. And thank you for being such a dear friend and a good brother. I really appreciate yeah. you. Thank you so much. You too, man. Talk soon. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Yep. Ambassador Shabazz is here with How We Move. I'm so happy to see my sister looking bright and beautiful. What's going on? Oh, I'm a happy person. <laughs> then that I feel that every time I, I see your lovely face. It's real. It, yeah. And, you know, I think some of it has to do with age and time and reflection and mm -hmm. choosing not to falter, mm -hmm. right? And that falter just means that there's a new day. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes when you're young, you think you're stuck in it. And then you realize, no, this too shall pass. Now you get what those elders meant, right? And so what do you do to assure it? And so it's making real conscious choices about how to uh, preserve joy. <laughs> yeah. And preserve oh. skin. Whatever you're using yeah. for skin cream might be some of that natural Belizean coconut oil. Yeah. I don't know, but it's working. That's my mother, you know. <laughs> <laughs> There's some gene stuff going on. Yeah, yeah. I'm grateful. Marcus Samuelson, give me your thoughts on that conversation. When we start talking about joy and and exaltation, listening to him, having watched him for decades now, even though he's still young, you know, in a sense that when upon his arrival, it was really wonderful. We all welcomed him from a distance, just watching him hit the uh, hit the stage and seeing how just his own evolution of being uh, a student of and uh, and now teaching and inspiring and growing. I mean, it was just joyous for me to see his dedication to his his yesterday, his origins, mm -hmm. and ways in which he can pay it forward. And I have to tell you, could I have been more moved to hear him reference and honor the trailblazers? That does not happen enough. Too many people claim themselves and make themselves cover story. And while he is certainly living in real time as a cover story, he gave great homage to um, those that preceded Absolutely. Yeah. Too many eyes and me's often in those conversations, but uh, yeah, it's nice yeah. to hear a lot of we's and us. Oh my God. Yeah. We and, and future them, right. We I mean, kept moving that pendulum and also just taking on him when he talked about, you know, giving out food, even when people weren't paying for it, he said, they still, you know, being in Harlem is so real being amongst people who feel, and that's because they feel like your family, you know, it's like constructive criticism. It's, it's offering you some goods, you know, because they want you to do it right, do it better. And we're still here with you. Yeah. So him being able to understand and take all of that in and share it and move it around and it was just really wonderful for me to hear. As I start to slow down certain aspects of my own life, there's nothing more glorious to, than to know that there are folks after who are going to make sure that our richness and our calibers are ever present. Lovely to see you. You too, my dear. Thank you.